Good evening, everyone. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge any elders that might be present with us this evening. So tonight, we've got a very, very special guest all the way from Brooklyn, Glory Edom, um, and she's the founder of Well Red Black Girl. Um, part of this is part conversation, so Glory and I will have a conversation, and halfway through um, National Treasure, and one of my favourite humans, Maxine Vaniba <laughs> Clark, will be joining us um, to have an IRL book club with Glory. Yes. <laughs> um, but you can also purchase Maxine's book after the event, so readings are here tonight, um, and Maxine will be kindly, graciously, actually, um, signing those books for you. So... That's kind of how tonight's going to go. And there will be a point where you will be able to ask some questions. So, Glory, I will read a bio to introduce you, if that's okay. Go right ahead. If you don't mind having <laughs> to hear about yourself. Um, so, Glory is the founder of Well Read Black Girl, an online book club turned literary festival that celebrates the uniqueness of black literature and sisterhood. Well Read Black Girl's mission is to increase the visibility of black women writers and initiate mini meaningful conversation with readers using social media. That's quite a comprehensive uh, definition. Yeah. But I guess I want to know from you, um, who is a Well Read Black Girl? I love that question. <laughs> um, I really feel like Well Read Black Girl is open to interpretation. So. I self-identify as someone who is well-read, open-minded, cultured, um, curious, and I see that in so many of my peers. I see that in so many people that are going through social media just looking for reflections of themselves. Well-read just means simply being open and curious enough to find the things that feed you, things that open your mind up to a whole another world and allow for discovery. So how did this all start? I mean, did you have this vision in your mind? Like, how, how did you come up with this concept? No. <laughs> um, this was something that happened quite organically and quite by accident. So my partner created a shirt for me that said, Well Read Black Girl. It was for my birthday. And it was simply like an inside joke between us. Is that the same one that Lena Waithe wore yes, in Vanity yeah. Fair? Yes, yeah. So cool. the, the original shirt is not for sale. <laughs> it was something that he um, made especially for me. It had my birth date on it. It had uh, different quotes. And it was a, basically a, a little crest that he made for me. And uh, although we lived together at the time, he actually mailed it to me. Right. <laughs> so so it, was, it was a really lovely surprise. And... Um, and it really just started all these ideas. So I was constantly wearing the shirt in public, and people would come up to me and say, where can I get that, you know? And I, there was no place to get it. It was something that my boyfriend made for me. Um, from there, I really thought about this idea of being well-read and creating a community around it. So I then started the Instagram account, um, I started a newsletter, and I started a very small intimate book club that was probably about eight or 10 of my friends. Um, and we met together and we talked about books. And because of the social media, people were, were able to follow our conversations and see the things we were talking about and the photos that we were sharing. And it started to really grow into this whole other thing that I quite honestly could not imagine. From you know starting that two years ago to sit on the stage, I would have never thought that that would have transpired. Right. So had you always been a reader? Like, did you grow up reading books and loving yeah. books? I um I like I've learned to read pretty early, about two and a half, three years old. My mother taught me how to read, um, and it was something just kind of like I, I've always been really talkative and chatty, but with well, it was my mom's way of being like, okay, like I need you to be quiet now, so, <laughs> so like go into this corner, read this book, you know, um, and it, it just opened up new worlds for me. Like I've always been like a really big reader, but. You know, when I was younger, it was like Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High. Right. It wasn't necessarily that I was like actively seeking out black writers. It right. was simply just reading books for imagination purposes. Yeah. I was reading an article today that um, profiled you, I think it was the LA Times, where you talked about the books being like a sanctuary for you at a particular point in your life. Yeah. Um, do you mind talking about that? Like yeah, what yeah. Books um, so... My, when I was a, a senior in high school, entering college, my mom um, fell into a severe depression um, to the point where it rendered her speechless. Uh, she was selectively mute and wouldn't talk um, for a long period of time, 
for more than about three years. And during that time where we were learning how to cope and like just deal with mental illness and seek help, I really found my refuge in books in order to um, kind of seek out the advice that my mother was able to give me previously, but didn't have the voice to at this time. So I really started to rely on reading Bell Hooks, on mm -hmm. reading Alice Walker, uh, and reading it in a different way that wasn't just simply for entertainment. It was a way to just kind of like feel nourished in a way, feel like I could see myself in a way that my, um, my mom at the time wasn't able to, to give me, not because she didn't want to, she simply wasn't capable of doing those things. Was it almost like a guide to it, to, it to definitely. It was, a, it was a guide. It was a way of learning how to mother myself. Right. Um, and seeking out, even now when I quote a lot of things on the Instagram uh, or on social media, they are affirmations for my day. It kind of sets the tone on how I want to feel and how I want to move in the world. Um, and when I was younger, because all this happened in, in really formative years, I was just entering college at this time. I was a freshman at Howard University, um, really trying to navigate how to be a young uh, adult, as, as we would say now, adulting. I was trying to figure that out, and I didn't have the ability to come like talk to my mother about it. So when I was reading those things, I was like, really, how do I take care of myself? How do I find positive role models? How do I like build a um, almost like a self-talk? Right. Did you specifically seek out writing? by black women? Yes, yeah. completely so. I mean, I went to a historically black college, HBCU. I went to Howard University for that very reason. Um, I grew up in a very multicultural neighborhood. I grew up in, in DC. Uh, so it wasn't, I'd never had a lack of scene representation. I simply wanted to be uh, further into it. My father is also a graduate of Howard University. So it was almost a legacy thing too. I really wanted to go to the same school as he did. Right. And so, you have these experiences where you are turning to books as a refuge and you're seeking out specifically black women writers. Um, and a couple of years later, your partner decides to make you this wonderful crest shirt and, yeah, yeah. and then this community starts to grow. So I guess I'm interested in the early iterations of Well Read Black Girl. Um, what was that like? I mean, what was the first meeting like? Did you... Yeah. Did, did you put it on Twitter, like how did that happen? No, no, um, well we, well first of all, I always give credit to Naomi Jackson who was the first author to actually accept my invitation. We were reading a book called The Star Side of Bird Hill, which is a, a coming of age story. And the main character, her mother is dealing with mental illness. So when I read that, it completely pulled me in because I, I saw myself in it. It was also a story about a young girl who was living, a first generation young girl whose um, mother was an immigrant and dealing with all these things. Um, and I'm also first generation, both my parents are Nigerian. So once I read her book, I like connected with it. So I went to one of her readings and I spoke to her and I was like, you know, I was telling her about this book club I started and I invited her to come and she said yes. So from that moment, because that's another thing that makes the well-read black girl community so special, we always invite the author to come join us in conversation. In every single book club. Every single book right. club. Um, in the beginning, it was like every single, we've been able to, you know, there's been different iterations. So sometimes now authors Skype in, um, sometimes we do Twitter chats. We find different ways to pull the author into the conversation. But originally that first year, there was always an author in the room with us. Right. Um, so with Naomi, it was about eight, eight of us, and we ended up meeting in this small bar in Brooklyn. We went during the daytime, so the, the bar was not, you know, it was available. Um, and we sat in this little garden outside, we sat in a circle, and we just talked about her book, and she read a passage from it. And at that time, she also brought a guest with her. She brought a Native American poet named Natalie Diaz, who's a good friend of hers. She ended up just coming. So I, I was in, this, in the room with these two wonderful poets, um, writers who just, completely offered experience about their process, about craft, why they wrote the book, how it made them feel. The women in the room were able to ask some questions. And it was just very intimate and mm -hmm. loving. And um, my partner, he joined me that, that day too. He actually recorded it. He's a filmmaker. So he ended up recording the, the experience too. So I had that as a you know, part of my archive. You know, yeah. So the first couple of book clubs, um, they were all word of mouth. Naomi Jackson ended up in, um, introducing me to Angela Forney, who wrote The Turner House. She ended up being our, our second book um, selection. She came to the conversation. Again, very small. There was probably another you know, seven people in the room. Um, 
And it just continued like that, word of mouth and talking and having these conversations. So I guess if you've created this space and you're, you have uh, black women in this space and black women writers, does the conversation at some point move beyond the writing to almost be like a sense of validation for whatever the experiences were? Is, is, I'm trying to imagine what this space must feel like for some yeah. of the women that come into, come into your book club. As it's grown bigger, I definitely say it's, um, it's hard to capture the intimacy that we had when it was only six, seven, eight people. But in those initial meetings, it really was about being vulnerable, being very transparent and discussing your life. As I said with the book with Naomi, um, that book deals heavily with mental illness. So there were women in the room that were sharing their own stories. I was open enough to talk about my experience with my own mother. Um, so it becomes, beyond just reading, it becomes a very therapeutic experience where people can um, feel centered. Because mm. I, I think a lot of times black women don't have the ability to feel like the focal point is only on them. Right. So with that, there's an openness that comes. You like let your guard down a little bit. You don't have to feel like you're being judged or compared to. You can simply be. Right. Um, and I think that is why the community has grown so much because we're, we're able to be honest and authentic with one another. And in these rooms, there's also discourse that happens. Not everyone agrees. I've had plenty of books that have really made people frustrated or angry or you know, been able to say, like, I don't like this because, and say why, and have just respectful dialogue. Um, and I think that's also really important. It's not only us um, sitting together and being in agreement. Mm -hmm. It's also us like talking and having a space to be just honest with one another. It almost seems, just hearing you talk about it, it almost seems like a very common sense idea. I mean, yeah. this idea of getting women that shared the same lived experiences, talking about the lived experiences through the work of someone that's written about those experiences. But why did it take so long? I mean, I, I have never heard of another version of a well-read black girl, a community that specifically... You know, I, I, that's some, the one thing um, as the founder, as the person who's like moving this forward that I struggle with, because I actually do, are, I am familiar with a lot of communities like this. They might, they're much smaller, they may not have um, as much shine on them right now, but I think the communities exist, we, I, whether... Um, they're using social media, you know, that, that's maybe the, the strongest point of what I've been able to do, been able to take the intimacy that we share in the room and been able to translate that online um, and use my self as almost a conduit to share that, um, the things that I have access to, I, I constantly want to share. I want to be able to be a resource for other people. But I would disagree because like a book club, though that's, you know, I've been in a book club since I was, what, eight years old? But there's something unique about Well Read Black Girl. Like, it, it doesn't just feel like a book club. It feels like, for me anyway, it feels like being part of a movement. It feels like you're being part of a community, like being part of a sisterhood in, yeah. in a different way. Yeah. Like, I know that I have learned a lot about black female literature as a result of Well Read yes. Black Girl in a way that I would never have had access to. Yes. Um, and I think that in itself is quite unique. I don't think I've actually seen anyone take the time to curate that sort of information mm. that's specifically deliberate. Like it's yes. deliberately focusing on a certain group of women and kind of going, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, well I appreciate that immensely because that is what I'm trying to do. I think what I draw a lot of inspiration from is oral history. Um, when I was a student at Howard, I was constantly you know, in libraries, I was constantly looking at archives, my background is in um, journalism, and it's, so that all came to me very naturally. Um, but you're right, it is about curating an experience and being gentle with, with, um, with this idea that you don't need to know everything. Like mm. one of the pillars of our mission is really making it accessible. Um, and social media has allowed for that, Instagram. So if you look and see a photo of a writer, I hope it inspires you to look further and buy their book, go to the library, um, and c continue to, be, to cur be curious. And then once you have that information, share it with someone else. How did that process begin, that process of kind of going, we do have an online presence, and w I want people to engage yeah. with these writers in a way that they haven't before. I mean. It seems like it was you, you thought through that. Yeah, I mean, I was very intentional, but again, because of um, the fact that I went to a historically black college, it, some of the things that I do just kind of come like second nature. Right. 
you know, the, the, the women that I'm highlighting, I've been reading for a really long time, um, and my mentors have as well. So it, it is, I'm like, there are blueprints that already exist that I'm just trying to share with the world continuously. Mm. So, you know, Audre Lorde, Tony K. Bambara, Toni Morrison, their work exists to be shared and to be amplified. I think of myself as a connector and amplifier of their work. Right. What has surprised you about the community that you've created? Oh, wow. You know, there's so many things. I think what is, is surprises me the most would just be um, the gratitude that is expressed, um, the connections that have been formed. Women have gone on to create writing groups, to receive their own book deals, work on proposals together. Um, and there's a level of sisterhood and solidarity that um, extends beyond me. Like I, I've started something that lives beyond me and, and people are open to creating their own groups. Um, and that's what excites me, that it can just, it's not simply up to me, it's, it's about us doing it all together. Right. So what would you say to criticism about well Red Black Girl being a space that is predominantly focused on and speaking to black women, that it might be exclusionary to other mm. people? What, what, what do you say to that sort of criticism? Well, you know, I... <laughs> 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 As I said before, there are not a lot of spaces that center black women. And the fact that we have this one excellent space that is only for us, it needs to exist. There, there just doesn't need to be any... <laughs> like, there's, just, there's just nothing that needs to be in the way of that. Um, and luckily, I have received little resistance or criticism in, in that way, and I'm thankful for it, because we are not the mainstream. You know, black women, our voices are tend to be undervalued and not appreciated, and it's, we're over it, you mm -hmm. know? Like, we don't have time to wait for other people to do things for us. Um, and I'm just thankful that I'm able to, like, amplify us and lift us up. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. That is one of the things that I do love about what you've created is that you are putting the spotlight on black female writers. And writing is a very difficult industry. It's, yeah. it, and, it, and it's very tough. And I, and I love that you do spotlight a lot of these writers who perhaps are being ignored by the mainstream. Yeah. Um, why is that important for you? Why is it important that, you know, um, we, we continue to, I guess, highlight and amplify the voices of black female writers? Well, yeah, because it's been, it's been way too long. Like, I think of the writers that, um, that we continuously give homage to, as I said before, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Zora Neale Hurston. We love these writers, but there's a whole new generation of women that are creating incredible work that needs to be acknowledged as well. And I'm looking at the new literary canon. How can we usher that in, in, in a way that's powerful? How can we allow their work to be just recognized? Uh, and that really speaks to economic empowerment. They need, their books need to be bought. In order to get on the New York Times best sellers list, like you need to have your book purchased. Um, and so I, I honestly, if no one had ever, you know, given me the spotlight or acknowledged what I was doing, I would have been okay with every, all the women in the room just buying the books and us talking about that. That yeah. felt just as powerful. Yeah. Um, but now that the platform has grown, I feel a large responsibility to continue the work that I'm doing and to help even more people and create a path, passageway um, to enter publishing. Mm. Um, my background originally isn't in publishing, but thankfully I am resourceful and I've worked in marketing, I've worked in other areas um, around strategy that I can see how to enter the industry in a way that that just allows for more innovation and taking risk. Uh, you know, previously before I started doing Well Read Black Girl full time, I worked at a startup, I worked at Kickstarter, and I worked with so many people that would just have no clue on how to enter or, or get acknowledgement. Mm. And that's ridiculous. Like the, the industry needs to be way more transparent. So apart from the book club and some of the events that you host through the Well Read Black Girl community, you also hosted your first festival yeah. last year. 
um, which looked amazing yeah. and seemed really, really cool. It was great. Um, what can you tell us? <laughs> what can you tell us about that? What was that like? I mean, you obviously brought uh, black female writers into this space. There were conversations there. I am only, you know, drawing a conclusion based on what I've seen online. But I, I would just like you to uh, yeah. talk us through that. Well, it, it was a really magical event. We had. Um, over 500 women in the room. Right. And we had Jacqueline Woods in there. We had emerging writers. We had established writers. Um, Tiari Jones. Like, so many incredible people that are based in New York that are doing incredible work. And how it happened, quite honestly, was, like, through my cell phone. <laughs> I just ended up t texting and emailing a lot of women that I admired, um, several women that had participated in the book club previously, and just asking them if they had the time and, you know, space to come on this one day, um, and, and I had a lot of support from the community members in terms of helping me plan, having volunteers, um, like every single thing you could imagine. Like creating a festival is very difficult. Like any kind of event, producing an event is, is very challenging. And at the time, I was still working my full-time job. Wow. Um, so I had to rely heavily on my community to make it happen. And even raising capital, I had to do a crowdfunding campaign in order to raise money, um, to create merchandise, um, all these things. But why was it important for you to take it from this online platform to this physical form where people could have that well, yeah, interaction? Because so much of it was the beauty of the, the book club. It was growing so quickly that I wanted it to be everyone in the same room. I wanted to see what could happen if it wasn't just you know a two-hour book club meeting. If we had a full day to really dedicate to the work that we admire, what could happen? And we had people traveling from all over the United States in order to come into the room. Um, for me, the creating stuff online is great, but the real magic happens inside of the room when you can like tell the author that you admire, like your work changed my life. And I wanted to, like, I know how that feels for me when I fangirl and get so excited over a passage. And the festival was that, it was just a, a full manifestation of meeting the, the women that you admire. Right. And are you going to have another? Festival? Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm planning for that. <laughs> I'm like working very hard on that. I have a steering committee right now, and I'm getting all the things in order. Yeah. And you're also moving from not just being a reader to now being an author, which is yeah. which sounds pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is very exciting. Um, uh, right now, I'm working on an anthology collection. So um, a lot of the women that were in the festival have contributed essays. I did um, a series of interviews and conversations with different authors about when they first saw themselves in literature. Um, and a lot of the stories have just a wonderful nostalgic feeling of, you know, th like this is the moment in college or this was the moment when I was five and I read this children's book. There were just so many great gems in the story um, that I'm, I'm really excited to share. So I'm working on that now. I'm editing. So what kind of advice would you give to someone who is uh, feeling like they don't necessarily uh, belong or their voices aren't being heard, but they want to create a space that does feel inclusive for them and people that have similar lived experiences, given that you've gone on to create something that explicitly speaks to a particular experience. What kind of advice would you give people that are thinking about that and thinking about growing a community that further amplifies their experiences and their voices and stories? I would say be open to um, the signs that are around you. I know that sounds a little hokey, but like I think there's so many moments that uh, people don't tend to recognize. Like I could have just gotten that T-shirt and wore it every day and not acknowledge the people that were coming up to me and having conversation. But the more times it happened, I just like saw the the value and the beauty in it. Um, I think there's something about just like sitting and looking around you and seeing like what are the things that are are constantly being I'm being attracted to. Where do like where am I finding value? When where do I feel nourished? Mm -hmm. And Cultivate those things and seek out the people that are your tribe. Be really honest with yourself. Um, journal. Like there, there have been so many different things that I've started creatively before about Red Black Girl. This was the thing that felt most like me and the most authentic, where I, where I didn't have to like think twice about it. Um, and I would say gravitate to the things that you don't think twice about. And. What advice would you give them in terms of dealing with criticism if there was backlash to the fact that people are creating spaces that are 
exclusive in many ways? Well, I think if you, when you're doing things with integrity and you're doing things that are um, that you deep, feel deeply that they're right, um, there there is no criticism that you can that you won't be able to handle. Uh, I know that what the work that I do is honest and it's like my best self. And I imagine that other people that want to create similar communities, um, they're they're doing things in a way that they want they want to be seen. Um, being be yourself and be honest. I think that's like the 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 best advice I can I can give. Um, and the other things. I mean, if I can say the word, it's bullshit. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it's like to, don't be dissuaded by that, you know. Yeah. Like, criticism is actually good. Like, you should be able to hold your argument and like, feel firm in what, like, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Like, I don't think people should back away from criticism. Yeah. Um, before we bring Maxine onto the stage, I do yeah. want to ask you, you talked about how this all wasn't planned. It all started yeah. from a T-shirt and grew into this amazing community. Yeah. But what was it like when you saw the T-shirt in the pages of Vanity Fair? Like, that yeah. must have been like, <laughs> what is going on? I, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Well, originally, when the news broke, and, you know, when you were, if, if, you know, on Twitter, when something happens, it feels like instantly. And I was on a plane. I was, like, traveling. So my, like, my best friend and, like, people were texting me and sending, sending me things. And so I thought I was in Vanity Fair. I was like, I'm in Vanity Fair? <laughs> like, what is happening? <laughs> like, like, no one, I didn't sign anything. What are we talking about? And then, and then I, like, took a step back and I saw Lena was wearing this shirt. And I just was just so, so grateful because I love and admire her work. Um, you know, I've just like I've been following her for such a long time, and she is such someone who is so creatively brilliant. And she didn't have to do that. You know, like I felt like that in itself was just a sign of solidarity and sisterhood. The the way that we can, when we buy each other's books, when we wear each other's merchandise, it's it's a sign of like I see you and I appreciate mm-hmm. your work. Um, and to have that in the pages of Vanity Fair, that that was just like the. It was just like a beautiful affirmation, and I was very grateful. Yeah. Um, at this stage, I might invite Maxine onto the stage. Come and on as in. she walks up um, to, to take her seat, I've got one final question, yeah. and this is a book recommendation. Do you have five books that you could recommend? Yeah. I could bring it down to three. Yeah, <laughs> five yeah. is too much. Of uh, black female writers' books that we need to read. Obviously, yes, Maxine's yes. book is one of them. I have so many. Okay, first, The Hate Race, <laughs> number one. Um, I would also recommend Toni Morrison's The Origin of Others. I would also recommend Zinzi Clemens' What We Lose. I would also recommend um, ooh, Tiari Jones's An American Marriage, um, Audre Lorde's Sister Outsider. Uh, what else? There's so many great books. That was five. Oh, that was five. <laughs> yeah. I can keep going. I have like so many recommendations. Going. I can do it forever. But we're going to have a book club. So welcome, Maxine. Thank you. <laughs> So typically when we have the, the book club in Brooklyn, we have our house rules. Um, you guys aren't going to really be participating, but we'll pretend. <laughs> <laughs> and we like to you know, introduce ourselves, say our pronouns, um, be respectful and kind to one another. That is always the goal at any time we have a book club. Let's be respectful, let's be kind. And I absolutely loved your book. Thank you. Thanks. I felt like you have a brilliant memory. I cannot remember anything that happened in the last 48 hours, but you <laughs> were able to remember things so precisely and so clearly, and I, I love that. And I also disliked Carlita. <laughs> um, poor so, Carlita. Poor Carlita, but there's so many, as you said before, there's so many Carlitas in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to know just your origin story in terms of why you felt compelled to write this book and, and especially like now, in terms of time frame, like why was it important to write it now? Mm. Uh, in terms of origins, you know, my grandparents grew up in the Caribbean, so my dad's side in Jamaica, my mum's mm-hmm. side in Guyana, and my grandparents migrated to the UK as 
really part of the Windrush generation, which we've all been hearing about right. um, at the moment. And so my parents lived in the UK from when they were kind of four or five. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're kind of English or they were you're raised in, in mm -hmm. London and came out here in 1976. And so, you know, I had this childhood of growing up in suburban Australia, you know, really what was the rural fr fringe at the time um, in Sydney and never really thought of it as... A, like a, a unique upbringing mm -hmm. until really adulthood when people started to say, really? <laughs> you were in Australia in, like, in the late 70s and what, what, you know, what was that like? Um, and I think, you know, just real, realising I'd never seen another African diaspora story. You mm -hmm. know, when I was growing up, I read Indigenous literature yeah. and I read African-American literature and I read black UK authors. Mm -hmm. And so it just wasn't even really within my contemplation to kind of that there could be an Australian canon that went alongside those. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your process of like putting everything together in terms of craft? Mm -hmm. So I um, really, I think when I started going through the process, it was just, what can I remember? Mm -hmm. You know, that thing of there are a few incidents um, in, in, I think in all of our lives where you just remember for, for some reason really, really vividly. Um, and obviously in Australia at that time, uh, there's a lot of racism around, yeah. both casual and overt, And but there were particular incidents that I thought, you know, I can remember it, I can smell what that bottle brush tree smelled like when I was standing <laughs> underneath that I can hear that kid's voice. And right. so it was a process of just like blurting out those few moments um, and trying to, I guess, have some type of chronological um, process in terms of putting them together and, and, you know, how do these sit? And working out, you know, which ones... There were some incidents that were kind of... This happened, in, you know, when I was six and this happened when I was 16, but really they're the similar kind of, of racism. And right. what I wanted to do was map out the nuances, I think. Right. Yeah. I'm going to read a passage from, um, from your book that really struck me. Okay. So, it's, of course, it's about Carlita, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It had taken just a few months at preschool up against the constant jeers of Carlita Allen and any other kid she managed to co-opt in her anti-Brown crusade to wise up to the pearls of exclusion. I knew before I started big school that for me, the playground would be a battlefield, a world divided into allies and enemies. At five and a half, racism had already changed me. And when I read that, I was just like so taken by this idea because it's true. You have these moments that are fundamental um, and very formative. And at five, whether you had the language or not, you knew that it was wrong and it was uncomfortable. You knew it was racism. Mm. Um, now that you're a mother yourself, how are you helping your young children navigate this space where they're starting to learn and have encounters that uh, will be uncomfortable. They might have bullying. They may have mm. their own encounters with racism. How, how, what are you teaching them? I think, you know, the the process of being, you know, when I was growing up, I was, we were the only black family for a long, you know, for miles around kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so I, you know, I've chosen to live in an area in Melbourne's West that is really diverse mm -hmm. so that they can see people from, yeah. you know, all, all areas of the world. And I think that's part of it is kind of making sure that, they see themselves, you know, even if it's just someone walking down the other side of the street. Right. Um, and I think that was my first, you know, like where, where do I want to, to raise these kids, you know, where, yeah. where can I actually place them so that they, when there are these conversations, there's people going through similar kinds of things. Um, and I think this, I mean, my experience, you know, I have a child in high school now and a child in primary school, my experience is that the discussion is much more open now. You yeah. know, it's something that you weren't allowed to say the word racism when I was at school because mm. you were being a troublemaker. Yeah. You know, that that's how a, a, averse people were to actually discussing the problem. Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like there are avenues now, you know, but, I mean, probably I'm blessed in that sense because mm. if we were living somewhere else in Australia, that might not be the case. Mm. Um, but I feel like that dialogue um, and just, just kind of going, these are things we can talk about, yeah. you know. If someone says something to you, come and actually talk about it. Um, because that's when, you know, I guess that, that kind of vacuum of silence is when things become really harmful. Yeah. I was also curious about your parents in mm -hmm. the book. Um, they play such a huge role. When you, have they read the book? 
Yes. Yep. W- what do they think? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Especially your mom. <laughs> it's funny. I didn't give my my I didn't give anyone in my family a copy until it was a complete book. Okay. Because I feel like it's the kind of book where if you got a fragment, it's just like, what the <laughs> hell are you writing? You <laughs> right, know. Right, right. And so I gave them the uh, what we call the uncorrected proof, mm-hmm. which is you know when it goes out to bookstores, it just kind of has a plain white cover, and it's like this is the book. Booksellers all get to read it beforehand, and reviewers. So I kind of said, this is it. You know, let me know if you anyone you know wants any changes. I might not change anything, but <laughs> you know, let me know. <laughs> and it was funny because. Um, my mum read it first and she was like, I don't know about this. Yeah. You know, this is going to be really hard for you. I, I you know, just, yeah. you know, she liked it. Yeah. And, um. Well, did she remember, like, the, did she remember certain things? Well, the, the interesting thing was there was a lot of things in the book that she didn't know. Because oh, you wow. have this weird thing when you're a child where you, you're living in your own world. You're right. away from your parents for six, seven hours a day. Right. You don't necessarily come home and, and you know, tell them everything. Yeah. And and also you know that you know at that chart at that time as a black child, when you tell them it sometimes creates more problems because then you know mm-hmm. you go up to school, and so I think she was learning a lot of things when she read it. She was like, oh my god, now <laughs> I, and she did say some of these things I understand now because right. I had no idea. Um, and then when my sister read it. And we're very different, as you can tell from the book. You know, we're like chalk and cheese. I thought she is going to hate this book. And she was like texting me every chapter going, oh, my God, I remember when that happened and it happened oh, exactly so as I remember it. And so that was a surprise. That's awesome. You know, that my brother and sister kind of were like, this is, you know, this is it. This is our story. So, oh, that's yeah. so great. You also have a lot of pop culture references, which I enjoyed. <laughs> you know, you yeah. talk about watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and... Mm. Cosby and yeah. uh, listening to Whitney Houston. How do you think these representations in media influenced you? And I would even say change your trajectory in some points. Because when, when you describe these memories, you sound so like vibrant and mm-hmm. just overjoyed mm-hmm. um, compared to the existence that you're having at school where you're being bullied. Mm-hmm. Um, how did it offer you a level of just um, understanding and seeing yourself? Well, I think that's just it, just being able to see yourself. You yeah. know, it's such a um, – if you've never had the experience of never seeing yourself on television, you know, I remember just, like, stopping and staring. Whenever a black face came on television, it was like you – know, <laughs> you just and then it was over and it was like, was that real? <laughs> yeah. um, and I think also that unapologetic, you know, in the 80s and the yeah. 90s, like, not just blackness but unapologetic blackness, you right. know, Salt and Pepper and Bobby Brown and yeah. – and, um, and even though it wasn't, you know, obviously my cultural experience, right. just kind of going, they're doing what they're doing it their way. They're doing what they want, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think it has makes such a huge difference. Makes such a huge difference. Yeah. Can you do you recall what books you were reading during that time? Um, yeah, <laughs> Babysitters Club. Right, right. I mean, this, this is kind of like what you know, grade seven, eight kind yeah. of thing. Um, now, mostly books with white who's characters. Your, wait, who's your favorite babysitter? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, Jesse and Claudia, yes. of course. Yes. Of course. I wanted to be. Claudia was so cool, wasn't Claudia, she? Yeah, she was no. the best. Um, and uh, what else? Judy Bloom. Yeah. You know, you know, in Australia, it was. I mean, now it's hard to get black literature, but back then it was almost impossible. Right. So it was only if a relative sent us something and you didn't have the online environment either. Right. So it was like maybe once every two years you get a book with a black character in it or, you know, a book of West Indian fairy tales or something. So, um, yeah, it was just so rare. Do you... If you could tell your younger self, um, it's going to be okay, like... What affirmation or advice would you have given a young Maxine? Um, gosh, that's a hard one. I know. <laughs> I'd say you are right. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it wasn't in your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was actually happening. Yeah, yeah. And also, one day, Carlita will be in a memoir, and yes, <laughs> yes. she'll get her just desserts, you know. Yes. 
Do you see her on Facebook? <laughs> no, oh, the f- funny thing is, so the, you know, I changed all of the names, okay. you know, except for my name okay. in the book. Um, and, and a friend of mine who's also a writer, he was reading, he said, I'm getting so angry. And he said, I've tracked down Carlita Allen. No. <laughs> She's on Facebook. And he no. sent me this screenshot. I was like, no, you need to reverse out. It's not her. It's some poor woman with the same name. <laughs> Because I thought, you know, it sounds like no one would, you know, it's just a name that I was like, no one would possibly be called Carlita Allen, you know. So I oh hope that gosh. poor woman hasn't got too much. That is so funny. <laughs> but I, I was so irate. I was just like, I was so angry. Yeah. Every time I saw her yeah. name, I was like, Carlita. <laughs> so horrible. That's, that's, I'm glad you told me you changed names because I thought it was yeah. real too. Um, that is too funny. What, let me go to my questions hold, please. Oh, you know, the, the prologue, too, struck me. Um, why, why did you decide to open that way? Mm-hmm. Because with, with that, I envisioned the book going in a totally different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious, with what, what was about that one incident with the person who was saying these horrible slurs? That Why did you want to open with that, with that vision? Okay. Um, I think there's two things. The first thing when I started out writing it, it was going to be a life memoir. Mm-hmm. So I was going to go up to age, you know, 32, I think I was when I started writing yeah. it. And, um, and throughout the process of writing it, I realised that there were two, two completely different stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was almost impossible, you know, unless you're going to have a giant book to actually track you know, the change in Australian society, the change in the kind of racism, and that that 80s and 90s was such a particular time, Mm -hmm. and not just in my life, but in Australian history in terms of what was going on politically. Um, And also that that incident, you know, the reason I kept that incident at the front is firstly, with a childhood memoir, I think one of the dangers is people saying, oh, wasn't, weren't we racist back then? You know, isn't it glad? We, aren't you glad we're not like that anymore? You know? Um, and also that was the precipitating incident was that this thing happened to me. You know, yeah. I was abused by a guy in a ute, you know, and when I kind of said to other school parents, this has happened, they were like, oh, that's terrible. I went, really? This, this is not unusual. Right. And how do you actually explain to somebody who's never experienced racism right. what the cumulative impact of that is like? That by the time you get to that incident where you're right. being yelled at, you've had 30 years of, of those kinds of incidents. And so that was kind of the precipitator. So I thought I need to keep it in there to kind of really show that this is a, you know, it's, yeah. it doesn't stop, you know. Right, it continues. Yeah. If this book was going to be continued, like a, a, if you had done until 32... <laughs> or, or, you know, what yeah. would you add? Because I, I also felt with, I wanted to know more. Are there mm. parts that you, like, left out that you edited out of this piece? Of this book? Yeah. This book is, um, I think there were two chapters, like probably 17 and 18, <laughs> that right up until the end I kept saying I might pull them. We might just take them out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they were the bits that, if anything, was you know left it just because it was so exposing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, you put a book out, you do a book tour, you know. But but I left them in there because I felt like this is what the book's about. Right. You know, it's about the the limits it pushes you to. Um, in terms of continuing it, you know, <laughs> I went to law school as a black woman, so <laughs> that's another. So- <laughs> Four books. Yeah, yeah. Itself. So it's another. It's a whole another level and a different kind of. You know, once you're actually dealing oh, with yeah. elites, you know, it's really a different kind of racism. It's much more sly and subtle and structural. And right. Um, so maybe one day we have some lawyers in the audience. I hear some some nods and some snaps. Um, I th- I think we're gonna open it up to. Qu- questions yeah. as well. Yeah, there's an usher, there are two ushers actually. So if you just put up your hand and if you've got a question for either Maxine yeah. or Glory and and just remember the rules. We've got a question down keep by the front. Respectful. Here. We've got a hand <laughs> up. <laughs> if you just keep your questions brief as well. Thank you. <laughs> hey, um First of all, I just want to say you guys are all glowing as hell. Like, it's just been so nice to just sit at the front and see you guys. So beautiful. Um, yeah, I just have a question about where do you draw the line from, like, separating the author, the artist from their work? Because I'm currently um, trying to cut – well, not really cut off, but I'm sort of, like, contemplating with a certain 
um, author that's been going under fire about some transphobic comments that they've made lately. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a black woman, so if y'all can connect the dots. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say her name. But, um, yeah, so is it possible to appreciate someone's work and, like, sort of... Because essentially appreciating work is supporting it. So does that mean you're also supporting the problematic individual too? And also if you've had situations like that, how did you sort of like go drawing that line? That's a great question. Who wants to... Maxine, well, Maxine you're the, the author. <laughs> you That's a start. hard one. <laughs> is it Kanye? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I know who you mean. <laughs> Oh, I think it's a hard one, you know. Yeah. I mean, I I find it difficult to buy and read someone's book if I've, you know, if what they've displayed publicly is is just despicable. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there are authors whose writing I've loved and then they've disappointed me. Mm -hmm. And I think I still love that book <laughs> that I read before they disappoint. You know, there's no way of changing the fact that when I read it, I actually loved that book. Right. Whether I would buy another book, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, it's a, hard, it's a hard line as well because there are authors that I don't, you know, I'm not fussed about whose work I love. But, you know, when it actually comes to that level of... Um, causing harm to other people in the world. It's, it's, you know, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, it just depends on is this person setting out intentionally to say these comments and hurt other people? Are they lacking integrity? Are they completely willfully ignorant? I, like, I do my best to to judge a person on the words that they say and the, the, the words they say and what they write. So if, the, if you're making these statements in a public forum, you're going to be open to criticism. There's a, that's a consequence to it. Um, but if I've read the work previously and I've enjoyed it, it's, it's a little, it's hard to like go back and forth. But um, the, once they say those comments, I want to hold them accountable and I want to challenge them on it. And if they're not able to... Yeah, if they're not able to, you know, be respectful, I am about being like, okay, I can't, I can't support this work anymore, mm -hmm. especially when it's endangering other people. Like that's uh, unexcusable. But do you think it's harder when it is a black woman, as this example is, where you know, as you said earlier, they're, you know, it's already hard enough as it is being a black female writer. No, and I don't think it's harder because I think like simply because we're we're black women, that, like we need to be able to critique one another. You know, I like that. That that's goes back to this idea of respectful discourse. So, I critiquing and holding other women accountable. That's like that is sister. That is like helping you you grow. If you're not able to take that, then I don't I don't know I don't know. Like I feel like I'm a little bit. I I try to like stand really firmly about that because I'm just. If you can't take my critique and you can't take my honesty, then. That, that, that's an issue, mm -hmm. and we should address it. Mm -hmm. um, cause I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Glory or Maxine? There's a hand up. We can talk about it more in person. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this question's for Maxine. Uh, so as students are uh, studying your book, collection Foreign Soil of short mm -hmm. stories in literature this year. Mm -hmm. And I just have a question about the quote you decided to include at the start of the collection. Uh, it's by Achebe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let no one be fooled by the fact that we may write in English, for we intend to do unheard of things with it. And I'm just wondering, like, how did that quote inspire you in this collection? Um, I think for me, you know, coming from being a diaspora person, you know, coming from, a his, uh, you know, the legacy of slavery, basically, where people who were brought from Africa to the Caribbean essentially lost their language, weren't able to practice their customs. I think in part foreign soil, you know, and dealing with different types of accented English um, was my way of really reclaiming English. You know, we're taught to revere, you know, the Queen's English as the yeah. highest form of art, particularly in, in literary fiction. Um, and so that was partly my way of saying, you know, there are other forms of English that happened as a result of, of you know, language violence, essentially, and 
this book is my way of really, I guess, trying to reclaim that. Yeah. There's a question here at the front. There's a microphone. Thanks. Um, I just want to echo what um, a book said, who's in the front. You all look amazing, each single one of you. <laughs> just just beautiful. Um, uh, two, two quick things. One, um, it's, it's really good to see there's a sister working at Wheeler Centre. Um, I've been coming to Wheeler Centre for a while and we've had so many guests from around the world um, who are people of colour, but I've never seen anybody here working who is a person of colour. So I just want to acknowledge that because it's important, representation matters. And um, s uh, my question is, because I do have a question. Um, <laughs> uh, so my question is, um, these, um, nowadays it's really hard to read because of all the distractions with social media and so on. I I'd like it if you could go around and perhaps say how you make time to read. Oh, yeah. And shout out speaks of books. Yes. <laughs> I was just about to say, before you answer that question, the lady that's the usher there, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's also curated an online space. We met. For, oh, you did. We so, met in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so um, just to shout out to your online space, what is it again? Negro Speaks of Books. Negro Speaks of Books. And it's, it's, it's essentially like... That's right. Yeah. And it's amazing. And I'm, I'm following as well. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I, I just thought I'd mention that because I saw you and I was like, okay. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you read? Where yeah. do you read? How do you make time for it? Um, I read on my commute. So I, in New York, I take the subway a lot. So that's um, primarily where I read when I'm traveling. And I really gravitate towards poetry and short stories. Um, it just makes me feel very accomplished. I can read a short story in the <laughs> 20 to 30 minute you know, ride on, on the subway. Um, and then I tend to read 45 minutes before I go to bed. So the, the book club pick that I'm reading, I'll, I tend to like, it helps me relax and go to bed. And so I'll read like a chapter. Uh, and I also, because I'm like reading for a facilitation and trying to figure out questions, um, I have a, a special journal where I kind of like note things out and have a process of going, like going through it. So that's like, those are the ways that I primarily read. I really encourage the poetry aspect, read more poetry. <laughs> Maxine? I find it really hard <laughs> to find time to read, um, which is terrible as an author, but um, if I read in bed, I would last about two minutes. <laughs> like, I pretty much need to be under a cold shower <laughs> while I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> But you're also like, a mother. You have yeah, kids. Yeah, I have yeah. no kids. <laughs> but I do have, you know, like my daughter has a one-hour gymnastics class where you have to sit in the waiting room. That's my reading time. <laughs> so, like, pretending I don't see the other parents so I don't have to talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then I managed to get them into music classes at exactly the same time this year. So I'm like, there's a cafe across the road. That's my reading time, That's you know. Great. But, yeah, I have to plan it because otherwise, you know, it just yeah. evaporates or... Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, and this is just stemmed from Maxine's response to the question about foreign soil and your creation of this space. And, I'm, and I've just been thinking about the importance of black literacy and why spaces like this, like Well Red Black, in terms of encouraging literacy amongst, you know, um, black people and reading and, and being able to have the language, the tools to be able to... Um, be empowered in, in many ways, a very divisive world. Mm -hmm. um, why is that important for spaces like this in that context to exist? Um, I think so much of it is about representation. And so when you are not used to seeing yourself um, in the pages of a book, or you don't have the, as you said, the vocabulary to express how exactly to deal with this microaggression, um, you suddenly, to be in a room with other black women, or just black people in general, it allows you to feel more empowered. Uh, and with that empowerment comes another way to articulate exactly how you feel without stumbling over your words, without feeling self-doubt. Um, for me, the moment I left my campus at Howard University, I suddenly was thrown into this world where 
not everyone looks like me. And I'm starting to question things. I'm starting to question my existence and if my value matters. And I knew, I knew innately that it did. Mm-hmm. Like there's no way that that's like a reality. But w- when you enter the room and you're the only black person there, self-doubt can creep in. Yeah. And I think that that's the importance of these spaces where we can affirm and validate that our experiences, they're, they're not in our head. The Carlita Islands do exist in the world. Mm-hmm. These microaggressions are happening. Um, and we can just be comfort one another. Right. That's, that's how I feel. Maxine? Um, I think as well, you know, there's this sense of even though, you know, I'm writing really with, a, with myself in mind, you know, what yeah. would I have liked to read? Um, at the same time as you're curating the book club with, you know, what, what am I interested in? It goes beyond that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're here with a, with a mixed audience talking right. about our work. Um, and I think for me also going into schools this term with, with you know, my other book, Foreign Soil, seeing black kids have classmates study black work. Right, right. You know, like this idea that, you know, they're just stories. Yeah. You know, and why are we so locked into, you know, reading, you know, in terms of black women, we understand why we're seeking out black work because yeah. there's such a dearth of representation, but also going this work, although it affirms us, it's you know, can be read by anyone, right. you know? And it teaches more empathy. Absolutely. It's like you can see, like, I had no problem reading Wuthering Heights or Little Women. I saw myself in Joe. Absolutely. It, you know, yeah. so there's there's no reason that someone can't read uh, Chinamanda or um, Tirari Jones and not have that same experience. Mm-hmm. It, th- th- you're completely right. It works both ways. It allows mm-hmm. for the other person reading the books to have a wider lens on the world. Mm-hmm. We probably have time for two more questions if anyone's got some. There's yeah. a couple of hands going up. Yep. One towards the middle and one down the front. Thanks. Good evening to you all. Thank you so much for uh, for your book, uh, Maxine. Amazing for the spaces that you've been creating, yeah. Um, and yeah, just for the conversation tonight as well. I wanted to ask. Uh, just recently, a very dear person to me described me as bougie. <laughs> and um, basically, what it was, was uh, they were, we were discussing, and it was basically a, 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 a situation where they're like, can't reconcile your kind of, your self-twerking with you reading poetry. It doesn't... <laughs> It's, it doesn't seem like the same you. And that was, it was like, it was a, not a deep comment. It was a passing comment from someone who isn't a person of color and probably doesn't understand that kind of identity. Right. You understand it, where I'm going from. So I wanted to ask, how would you three, all three of you, I'd like you to answer if you could, what advice would you give to your younger self? I just turned 22 last week. Hey. Happy um, birthday. <laughs> Hence the twerking. Uh, <laughs> um, but what advice would you give to your younger self as a black female navigating that space and also coming from, I know all of you from diasporic um, background, what navigating those, those different identities, you know, um, those things that are supposed to be quintessentially black or African things that maybe don't necessarily reflect yourself. And then being in spaces, say, uh, where you connect to the well-read black girl thing, but don't really feel like you're the same bougie or bourgeoisie um, narrative that doesn't also relate to you? And what advice would you give to someone trying to navigate that? Right. Um, first of all, who wants to Urban Dictionary bougie for people who might not particularly understand it in this context? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'd, I'd go to you, Maxine, because you're the writer. I'll go <laughs> with words. <laughs> No, are you, are you actually Google. Urban Dictionary? Yeah, okay, <laughs> that sounds good. So while we wait for Glory to Urban Dictionary, I will take one final question and then we'll, 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 we'll respond to this one. So the final question. Weird question. What message do you have for white women? Oh. <laughs> no such thing as a weird question. 
So do we? Did did you? Oh, want to answer? My, you know what? My let's let's answer the the. Uh, well, okay. I'll, answer, answer this one first, and then we can end on that one okay. on the, the on the advice one last. Advice for um, white women would be continue to support and read um, literature by women of color, um, by black women and to be open-minded and to, to really listen attentively to um, when you're in conversation or in spaces that, um, that focus on us, to really focus and give us your full intention. Um, I think that would, that, that would be my advice. Um, listen. I think that's my advice. Just listen. <laughs> Great. So do we have a definition? I don't have the Urban Dictionary one. Well, hold up. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, this is like my age. <laughs> like, okay, fine. Urban Dictionary. I think okay. my advice on that one was just not, you know, like you fall into, I guess, the trap of, you know, as black women, you're constantly trying to justify yourself. Mm. You know, that you're not, you know, well read enough or you're not musical enough or you're not sporty enough or you're not you know you're not kind of mother earth enough so just that that <laughs> kind of trap of just you know when you're hit with something like that not feeling like you need to actually provide any type of response or interact with it at all yeah, um, yeah. because it's something that I think a lot of other women don't get quite as much yeah. so this definition is basically the same <laughs> as if you know what bourgeoisie means. Okay, it's anything that is perceived as upscale from a blue collar point of view. Bougie, pronounced bougie, <laughs> it um, refers to the middle class in Europe, but refers to the more affluent class level in the United States. Okay, that that is fine. I I was thinking it would refer to the Migos definitions of bougie, like yeah. bad and bougie. <laughs> Because my, my you can look that up on Spotify. <laughs> my, my interpretation of bougie is always like if you are that black person that's trying to behave a little bit more superior to yeah other well, black people. That, well, it's like Hillary from Fresh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That's yeah, like a, yeah, 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 exactly, black exactly, exactly. Or, exactly. You know, exactly. Or Whitney from a different world. Yeah, I don't think it's anything. You can be bougie. You can be you can be whatever you want. Mm. I listen to Cardi B. I also like nice <laughs> things. I I love to <laughs> like like it's it's okay. I think my advice would be to be your most authentic self and not to rely on other people to define you or misread you. So you can be well read. You can also twerk. You can do all the things you want to do. Um, at 22, I did those things. I still do those things in my 30s. So don't let other people define you. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree. I, I, I definitely agree. Define yourself as you choose and wish and not get bogged down by the binaries. Um, I feel like I think, especially as women, yeah. um, regardless of whether you're a black woman or identify as, as, a, as another um, identity, I, I feel like we, we, we very much get closed up in what we're supposed to mean. Are you a difficult woman or are you sub, sub, submissive or are you yeah. all these sorts of things? And I feel like as women, we are complex and complicated and can right. encompass and embody so many different things. And it's just allowing yourself the space to be whatever contradictory form you manifest as. And there's nothing wrong with yeah. that. Yeah, and you reinvent, you That's change, right. you That's change right. so much, like continue um, with that. Yeah, and I think it's just allowing yourself to just enter that space. And, and the people that, you know, vibe with you will get that and people yeah. that don't, don't. But that's also fine, you know. You'll yeah. find people that just love all of that that makes you. Anyway, yeah. on that note, <laughs> <laughs> starting to sound like Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. <laughs> right. um, but um, it has been an immense pleasure hosting Glory and this version of Well Read Black Girl uh, all the way from Brooklyn to <laughs> Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you so much. And obviously, if you're not already following Well Read Black Girl on social media, really, what are you doing with your life? Follow, <laughs> follow. Um, and also, a big round of applause to our very own Maxine Bonnie Clark, yes. who is <laughs> awesome. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.